four different ways. One is through hunter-gathering, two is through Sweden cultivation, three is through pastoralism, and four is through civilization. So I'm going to look through each one of these, hunter-gatherer, Sweden cultivating, pastoralism, and civilization. And we're going to do this in a chronological fashion. So let's start with the oldest way of living, and maybe the best for many perspectives. It's called hunter-gathering. And we have been doing this as Homo sapiens sapiens since the very beginning, since we could first distinguish ourselves, Homo sapiens sapiens, from other primate species. Basically, this kind of mode of adaptation is based around stone tools. You hunt with your stone tools. You cut with your stone tools. You do everything with stone tools. You even use stone tools to grind grain to make flour. Now, hunter-gathering is characterized by very low densities. In Australia, in Central Australia, where there have been hunter-gatherers up until recent times, the ratio was something like one per six square miles, that is one per 10 square kilometers. Very, very low density. And as you can imagine from the title, the economy is based around hunting and gathering. So who does the hunting? Who does the gathering? I should say that again. Who does the hunting? Who does the gathering? As you might guess, the men do the hunting and the women do the gathering. Now, something might surprise you, dear listener, and that is that hunter-gathering is typically an egalitarian political structure. What that means is it's one of the most equal social structures in the world. In other words, you can't go to a hunter-gathering group if you're an alien and say, take me to your leader. The reason being, they're all pretty much equal. In some societies, there's a bit of a tendency for men to be above women, in particular in Australian Aboriginal societies. And in some societies, elders have pride of place over youngest. But aside from that, it's typically egalitarian. And the beliefs, the beliefs tend to be animistic. And what that means is you believe that stones, streams, trees, have souls in them, just like humans have souls. So you pray to them, you ask them to, to give you things like successful hunting and successful childbirth, that kind of thing. Now, hunter-gathering, you can find it, or could find it in Central Australia. You can still find it in parts of Southeast Asia, parts of Africa, um, in rainforests, in America. But typically, hunter-gatherers have, hunter have been pushed away from their traditional habitats into marginal areas, deserts, arctic tundra, and rainforests. So you and me, our ancestors, dear listener, have been doing this for 120,000 years. And but there are some of us, some of our ancestors, about 10,000 BC, so about 12,000 years ago, around about 10,000 BC, had a revolution. And we call this revolution the Neolithic Revolution. Neolithic. Neo meaning new and lithic meaning stone. Um, new stone. So we're talking about as a new stone age. And what was amazing, in spite of its name, it wasn't an age of stone, it was the age of metal. For the first time, Homo sapiens sapiens are starting to use tools that aren't exclusively made out of wood and stone. Now we're using metal. And this allows for two great new ways of making a living. One is Sweden cultivation, the other is pastoralism. Now, with Sweden cultivation, the main idea is this. I go to a plot, I chop down everything I don't need, I burn it, I wait for the rain to fall and get the ashes and take the nutrition that's in the ashes and put it into the earth. Then I plant the seeds of things that I want to grow like corn, like fruits, and they grow. And at the end of the season, I do my harvest and then leave it. I leave it and go to another plot and do the same thing. Well, guess what? I, for about 10 years, I go to a new plot, go to a new plot, go to a new plot. Then about 10 years later, I come back to this first plot I was just talking about. Chop it all down again, burn it, let this, the rain leach all the nutrition into the soil, plant my seeds to pick up the nutrition again, and the cycle starts again. So this is called Sweden cultivation, but it's also called slash and burn. Now with this revolution, this is the first time, 10,000 years ago, it's the first time that human beings, the first time that human beings have agriculture. 
And with this, we get higher population densities. No longer do we need about 10 square kilometers or 10 square miles to, to support a single person. Now we can get far greater densities. And this is associated with what we call horticulture. Horticulture is basically rain-fed agriculture rain-fed agriculture or gardens. So basically we're talking about gardens and we can find this all around the world but the famous example would be the Trobriand Islands. Now what goes on in these societies is more hierarchy. Typically now we're getting chiefs or heads developing whereas before it made sense, no sense to say take me to your leader. Now it does make sense because there's a chief of the tribe and we're finding there's changes in beliefs too. From about 10,000 years ago, we get more evidence of beliefs in gods and spirits. Not merely souls, not merely, that's the wrong word, not just souls in trees and rocks and streams and so on, but gods and spirits. Now, 10,000 years ago is a Neolithic revolution. We get a new form of uh, mode of adaptation that is Sweden cultivating. We also get another one at the same time, and that's pastoralism. Pastoralism is just an, a fancy way of saying herding. So uh, part of the Neolithic revolution, both for Sweden cultivators and for pastoralists, is animal husbandry. For the Sweden cultivators, it's to do things like ploughing. For the pastoralists, it's following typically cattle, things like um, cows and goats, and following them to where grazing is available. So like Sweden cultivating, pastoralism allows for greater population densities. There's more there's more stuff to go around and both forms are creating what's called surplus. With more surplus, you typically you get more hierarchy. I'll repeat that. With more surplus, you get more hierarchy. So both Sweden cultivating and pastoralism is producing more hierarchy. And also there's this kind of a new hierarchy of gods and spirits too. Like as with um, Sweden cultivating, pastoralists have their spirits and gods and not just the animism of hunter-gatherers. There's one other thing I want to say about this, and that is what they typically eat is uh, blood. You can cut the side of the animal and take um, the blood and drink that. Uh, milk, and also you can get uh, the meat, of course, the meat of the animals. So we've gone through three modes of adaptation. Now we have to move to the final mode, the mode that you, dear listener, and I live in, and that is civilization. Civilization starts about 8,000 years ago. That's about 6,000 BC. It starts where? Where else but in the Middle East? Somewhere around the Tigris and Euphrates River in what is now Iraq, or perhaps in Pakistan around a river called the Indus River. Now, the technology of this is, is, is very complicated. We get irrigated agriculture for the first time. For the first time, people are building channels and dikes from the rivers to support intense agriculture and single crops typically rice or wheat we're getting intense agriculture it's producing huge surpluses and what did i say before with surplus we get hierarchy with huge surpluses we get much more stratified societies and we get new kinds of rulers we could call despots or kings or emperors even finally and with this we get a belief system that becomes uh, polytheistic, poly meaning many theistic, theists meaning God, so many gods. And, and eventually with Judaism, Christianity and Islam really leading to monotheism. So you and I, dear listener, belong to this mode of adaptation, I would guess, civilization. And with this, we have to, def I'm going to use a definition from Wolf, whose great book Peasants is very useful if you want to look, read up on civilization. You have written culture. You have surplus production. You develop urban centers. So we're getting huge, huge population densities. And New York City, Sydney City, London City are examples of this. We're getting irrigated agriculture. We're getting complex division of labor. And lastly, and most importantly for my interest, you're getting the development of states. That is bureaucracies that have as their task or their brief to run the nation. Now, one thing, we live in civilizations, and we might think that there's a kind of development. Hunter-gathering is bad. With Sweden cultivating partialism, it gets better, and then civilization is the best. This is not what anthropologists think. For many reasons, we think hunter-gathering is a great way 
of living. It's a great mode of production. And one of these reasons is it's the most balanced in terms of the ecology. It's, it does the least ecological damage. It does do damage, but not the same as Sweden cultivating pastoralism and nothing like civilization. The other thing is it's a very efficient way to live. You can do all you need in two or three hours. Most of the time for hunter-gatherers is spent sitting around telling stories, gambling and having fun. It's only with Sweden cultivating pastoralism and then finally civilization, we're pushing up five, six, eight, ten hour working days. Hunter gathering has the least amount of work. And it's why Marshall Salins, in a famous book I encourage you to read, called The Original Affluent Society, that is hunter gatherers, the original affluent society, says this is the Zen route to happiness. Provided you don't have great wants, you can be happy as a hunter gatherer. And the other thing about hunting and gathering is it's not, uh, it's, it's not as complex and risky as civilization. With civilization, we all depend on each other in very intricate, intricate and complicated ways. There are glaziers, there are plumbers, there are lecturers, there are truckies, and we need them all. And if something falls to pieces, everything might go. And we also, as the Irish discovered with a potato famine, become reliant on certain technologies and certain crops. Now, if something happens to one of these technologies or crops, then everything goes as happened for the, in the great potato famine in Ireland. With hunter-gathering, you have much more options. You can choose this or choose that. You can have corn today, you can have nuts tomorrow, and that will keep you going. So in other words, you're, you're safeguarded from sort of the cataclysms that have faced civilizations in those typical decline, rise and fall, or decline and fall situations. All right, that's all I'm gonna say about mode of adaptation today. Later on, I'm gonna be talking about mode of production, and that's something else, so please don't um, get confused between mode of adaptation and mode of production, we're gonna talk about that later. But as you can see, this idea is crucial. It's probably, when I first found about, out about this, I finally found a way to understand human society in a larger sense, that there are four ways of going about making a living, and the way that I, the sort of society I belong to, which is civilization, is in no way superior to the other kinds, and in fact has many cons. Thanks so much to listening to me, the audible anthropologist, and I look forward to seeing you again. Bye.